Thank you, everyone of you for coming out to Lake Fork Arena. Thank you, everyone of you for watching tonight. First of all, Merry, Merry Christmas. It's the Christmas season. We got the captain back, Captain Ron's here. Ooh. We got Heath Taylor in the house. Heath brought some goodies. This is uh, Bass Fish and Santa Claus tonight. And uh, that's his little elf right over there. <laughs> and my buddy Dennis, who's going to deliver a message that we're going to talk about here in a minute. First, we want to start this off. We always like to say how much we're grateful for what you guys have done, what you guys behind the camera have done, what you guys in the audience have done to help us grow what we've grown and do what we do every day. And we want to prove that tonight a little bit more. We're going to start doing some giveaways. So we're going to start handing out some, some baits and some shirts. All right. And, Captain, you got a couple things, I believe. Whoa, I got a hat. Oh, oh. Ow. That's a hook. That's a He's got a hook and a hat. Got a, got a hat Captain, hook. Captain, Captain's Guide Service hat here. Captain Ron. Brought to you in part by Captain's Guide Service. Well, he's also sponsored by. Take over your baits and you can distribute those out. Get the elf to bring them. The elf, there the you elf. go. Yeah. Leave you go, sir. There. That's for you. Yeah, for Thank elf. you. Yes, sir. Awesome. Tell everybody to get a big yeah. handful. Tell them don't be shy. That shirt right there is the same shirt I'm wearing now. You should walk around with everybody. Well, you got the actual I don't want to. I don't want to take any of those home. So. Cold nut. This this joker right here, guy in the audience tonight, for all of y'all watching out there that can't see him, he bought the billy bag. Oh, you caught the 13 pounder. And the, like the first week it was out and caught a 13 pounder on the jerk bait that's in the billy bag. That's awesome. Man. The old dirty water. Congratulations. Awesome. Fish of a lifetime, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, so it is Christmas. First of all, I want to thank Heath Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and helping us out, and bringing the being being the bass fish and Santa Claus that you always are, man. We really appreciate that. Yeah. All right, next, I know that this is a fishing seminar, and we always talk about fishing, and we're going to give you that tonight. We're going to go. Me and Ronnie have kind of pre-gamed the topic. It's going to be really good. I'm going to follow him up with the topic that I'm really excited to go in more detail with you guys about that I've talked about a little bit in the past. Uh, but before we do all that, we're going to do something that's really important to me. And so I ask for your patience on this. I don't know where your belief system lies. I don't know what you like to do. Or you people out there watching it on, on, the, on the internet as well. But uh, we don't do this very often on this channel, but it's something that's very important to me. And with it being Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And to me, Christmas can be misconstrued and misled in a lot of ways. Kids especially like to get excited about presents and all this. And we get excited about spending time off work and with our family. And that's all great. But there's something that's more important than all of that. And that's the birth of Jesus Christ who saved all of us from our sins. That's what I personally believe. My good friend Dennis, who is a pastor, is going to give us a little Christmas special to get us started tonight. So, Dennis, take it away, brother. All right. So, Christmas, you know, it's that time of year. Things start getting busy. Things start getting crazy. So, I got to do what everybody likes to do at Walmart the other night, and that is I get a phone call from my wife when I'm still at my office that uh, I have to go to Walmart to get candy canes so that my son can make candy cane reindeer to give to all of his friends and that's fine so i go go over to walmart and i fight the crowd and this is south tyler it's about 6 30 so it's busy but you know it was all right i you know had a shiv and i was able to kind of fight my way through and check out and i walk outside and i'm on the way to my truck and i see it just a, a, a young man and it was just a young hispanic gentleman i've got no idea he was somewhere between the ages of 15 and 20. you know just young guy and he's got the remote to a car and you see him he hit the button he's looking around hit the button he's looking around hit the button he's looking around and i said man you, you lose your car in the parking lot yeah man I lost my car uh well it's Christmas. I'm right here. Well, well, man, what kind of car you drive? I hope you find it. What? What kind of car do you drive? You got to know what kind of car you drive. I'll help you find your car. He looks at me, looks at the keys, looks at me, throws down the keys and starts running in the opposite direction like a scalded ape. Just takes off running. And... I like to think that I'm not a stupid individual, but it took me a lot longer than I like to admit to realize before I caught on to what had just occurred. That kind of what was going on. So I ended up going, I got the keys, I took them inside and told the ladies, you know, the the uh, customer service what had happened and everything. And, uh, you know, kind of went up, but I, and I was shocked, you know, the whole time I'm driving home, I couldn't believe that I just encountered the dumbest thief in the history of the world. I mean, heck, you at least lie. You gotta be like, man, it's a, it's a civic. I mean, you say something, you don't just make it obvious, but 
as I was driving home when I was thinking about that, something kind of dawned on me that goes back to Christmas and this time of the year. And that guy was looking for a car so that he could steal something out of it. I was looking to get home and give my wife these candy canes so that she wouldn't yell at me for not. But we're all searching for something. Everyone in this room, everybody listening to this broadcast is looking for something. You're looking for something in life. You're looking for something right now. There is something in our life that feels incomplete. There's something that... We need to find something in order to fill it to move on. And when we think about Christmas and the Christmas story, uh, there's a group of guys that we see, and we talk about a lot every year. And my, my company, uh, I'm an electrical contractor, aside from being a, a, a pastor and a, and a preacher, because my dad likes it so much, every year our company Christmas card features the three wise men. We've never done one of the 10 years we've been that doesn't have the three wise men. And there's somebody we always talk about, and we talk about them in the story, and it's really neat. You know, you got these three guys, and they show up, and they, they bring these presents, and that's kind of all we know about them. That's really all we really talk about. But I was hoping tonight we could take a few minutes and see if maybe we have a little bit more in common with those guys than we, we might think. So in the Bible, we meet them in the book of Matthew. And we come across them in, in Matthew chapter 2. This is what the, the Bible says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, it, some Bibles say wise men, some say Magi. Magi is the technical term we'll get to in just a second for what these guys were. From the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, that word magi is a weird word. It doesn't mean anything to us. We don't, I mean, what is the connection? And I'm going to way oversimplify this because of time. But the simplest way to put it is these guys were star worshipers. Magi were priests of a religion called Zoroastrianism. And I could get really into it. And it's a Far East religion that goes back to astrology. And they studied and they worshipped the stars. And literally, in the year, you know, one, the time of Jesus, these guys knew about planets, and they would map them out, and they charted them. And all of this takes, took place, and where they were from was around Babylon, which is a big thing in, in the Bible, but if you're looking for kind of a point of, of, if, of contact today, basically they're from Baghdad. So it kind of gives you a real close to where they're from, and the way things have kind of change there. Billy's giving me a look. He's in Baghdad. I've been in Baghdad. Baghdad, Baghdad. So, but, uh, hey, so, but that's where they were from. And they saw a star and that star, we have come because we know something's happened and we've come to worship the child born. Now, the Bible's an amazing book. If you ever sit down and really just study the Bible and look at the way that things come together over a span of 3,000 years and the way that things peace and interlock, it would blow you away because why would guys that worship the sun and the stars have come to Jerusalem to because of a star? Well, it comes back to a guy that they knew as Belteshazzar. We know him as the prophet Daniel. In the, in the book of Daniel, we know that Daniel, the prophet of God, was in the exile when the Jewish Jewish people were taken from their homes and they were taken to Babylon. They were enslaved. And a small group of them that were select because of their intellect, most were members of the royal family, were taken and they were made as servants to the king and servants to, to these high officials. And one of them was this guy named Daniel that prophesied the coming of Jesus and was a high official, an important official in their government because he was so talented. And he said, hey, this is going to happen. And his words were recorded. And so when you fast forward 700 years later, these star worshipers, these guys who are far from God, far from not Jewish at all, but they knew who Daniel was. They knew what Daniel had said. He said, hang on, this guy said a star is going to come. And when this happens, it means the birth of God in the flesh. And so they followed that star. Now, there's some back and forth as to what it may be. Well, you know, 
Because we weren't there, we'll never vote, don't know for sure exactly what it was. But most kind of a consensus, or as close as we have to a consensus in theological circles, is that what the star over Bethlehem was, was actually the planets Jupiter and Saturn lining up along with the uh, constellation Regulus. And just the way that they came together to them, because of those two planets lining up, that meant something very special. That meant king, because you've got the two most powerful symbols in their authority coming together. But the way that it ties to the Bible, coinciding with the birth of Christ, is really amazing. So they go and they're looking for it. Let's see. Well, let's just let's follow this star. Let's see what happens. So then Scripture continues. When King Herod, who was the kind of a warlord and a leader over the people at that time, when King Herod heard, uh, he, was, uh, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him, when he had called together all of the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked, where was the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for that is what was written. Uh, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among rulers. Judah, for out of, all of, for out of you a ruler will come who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and he found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. Now, this all happened in, to us, our calendar, around the year 7. But it took place over a couple of years. As these stars came together, these guys started. That, it's a heck of a long walk from Babylon to Bethlehem. They didn't do this overnight. Most scholars say from the time that they would have began to the time they'd have got there would have taken somewhere in the vicinity of a year, but they probably would have spent seven months actually traveling. It actually took them seven months to get there. And so he's asking, hey, when did, when did this happen? When did you see the thing that made you know this was coming? And he said, go and search carefully for the child. And as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. Uh, as the star they had seen, as it, it, they went on their way. And the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now that sounds crazy to us, that the star stopped. Well, there's a weird anomaly in the way that the Earth orbits and the way that planets orbit. And that is, if you study and you watch the way that a planet orbits, at one point it'll stop. And then it'll reverse directions. And it just has to do with the way that our orbit crosses theirs. And it, it's a bunch of stuff that I don't understand. And, you know, I could pretend, you know, in college I had a buddy named Clark. And he was a meteorologist major. And we used to go to parties. And whenever Clark would talk to a girl, we'd go over and we'd ask him questions. Like, hey, Clark, you know, hey, it's a real pretty girl you're talking about. Hey, tell me something. What makes the wind blow? And Clark would forget about the pretty girl. <laughs> Man, all right. There's this pressure bank, and it comes in, and he would just lose it. And he would, and, and I know I can do that too. I can get caught up in these details, but it, it's really fascinating to me, and it's something I really geek out on. Is the way that all of these crazy, complicated things come together. That when you just read the book, you just read the words. We read over them. It's like I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. But if you start studying the greater thing around it, even if you were to look to science and all these things that people want to say, well, that just proves that it can't be. You know, the planet, you know, stars don't, don't, don't stop. They don't move and then stop. You're right. But planets do. There is an explanation for everything in the book. These things actually line up. And the harder you look to try and figure out what God has said, the more you'll find, hang on, that actually makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of moving parts but when you look at them with an open mind, it's amazing the way that they come together. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they were overjoyed, not overjoyed, overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother married, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Now I gotta admit, if I'm Mary, that's a freak out moment. I mean, now, she's already been through a lot. You know, she's already been through. An angel came to her, by the way, you know, I know you've never been with a guy, but <clears throat> you're about to have God's kid. You know, that's a that's a strange day. That's a, that's a freak out. Then she gets to go and tell her fiancé, by the way, I'm pregnant, but don't worry about it. It was, you know, this is the Holy Spirit. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy into that. So, yeah. you know... The, 
Then she goes, hey, you're summoned to a town that is a nine-day journey from your home while she's very pregnant. And so, you know, he gets her the best Uber he can, which is not the Uber Black. It's the one little camel or one little donkey. And they go. She gets to a town where there's no place to stay, has to have the kid. Now... And, you know, we take things for granted. You know, we always think of that this is like a little bitty baby Jesus, you know, newborn when the Magi show up. Most scholars believe he's actually closer to that one-year range. He, went, he was born. They start on their way. Now, you didn't just take a two-week-old and try and walk across the desert. So they had to stay in Bethlehem until the baby was big enough to travel. So they're staying in Bethlehem, and so they've been there a month, two, you know, two, two, you know, anywhere but you know the vicinity of a year, eighteen months, and suddenly uh, three long-haired hippies. And we don't actually know there's three. We say there's three, but it just tells us wise men. We don't know where there two, where there's sixty-eight. We don't really know, but three works for us. And you know, it looks like the lead singer of ZZ Top and two of his buddies have shown up and said, "Hey, by the way, we want to worship your child." That's a weird moment. But they come, and they pay homage to him, and then I, I love what happens. They bowed down, and they worshipped him. These are magi. They don't worship a deity. They worship stars. They knew something wasn't complete. They knew something wasn't wasn't right. They knew for all of their learning, for all of their wealth, which we're going to get to in just a second, they knew that they didn't have something. And they went out looking for it. And they followed the only thing that they knew. And they followed these stars. Going back to a book that was 700 years old, written by a guy from a religion that they had conquered. And they follow it until they meet Jesus. And when they met Jesus, they worshipped Him. Because the only thing that was going to complete them, the only thing that was going to fill that hole, the only thing that was going to make it right was for them to have that relationship with Jesus. The only thing that could fill what they were searching for was that relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know that through my own life. You know, I'm a, I'm a pastor, and I'm the first to tell you, you know, I grew up here in East Texas, and so... I always, I was raised, I always thought that I was a Christian, and that was mostly because I was, you know, mostly because I was white and I'm not Jewish. You got to be a Christian. I mean, nobody says they're an atheist, and I'm definitely not Muslim. So, I, I'm a Christian, right? That's just how I was raised. That's how we identified ourselves. I wasn't raised really religious. I wasn't raised in church. I was raised hearing the stories at Christmas and Easter. I had a understanding of who Jesus was. I even had a belief in it. Yeah, it makes sense to me. All right. It's what I've always been told. It's what my grandfather said. If it was good enough for Papa, it's got to be good enough for me. And I never questioned it. And it just made sense. But Jesus was a historical figure to me. I believed in him, but I didn't have a relationship with him. Might as well have been Abraham Lincoln. And that continued for me until January the 3rd, 2000. And that was the day that just life and everything had come together. And one of my teachers, Lindell High School, Janice Caldwell, speech and debate coach, was the person who I was talking to and was the person who connected the dots for me. That the problem wasn't that I didn't know about Jesus. The problem was that I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have a relationship that I had lots of knowledge, but I didn't know Him. And that it wasn't until I would know Him that I would ever be able to take the pain and the things in my life that I was trying to figure out what the heck was I supposed to do with and start to compartmentalize them. Because I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, and I'm not good enough to deal with them. But I serve a God who is, and it wasn't until I had a relationship with Him that I would be able to start to process and grow past so many things in our life. And guys, that's where they were. Whereas I was in a, a classroom at Lindell High School 
They were in Bethlehem after this long journey when they came face to face and they realized that they had to have that relationship and something in them changed. And then they did the thing that we always talk about, the origin of our giving presents. And they give these, these gifts. They give, you know, they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Now, those are weird gifts. You know, let's, you know you're, if you have to give a gift to a baby, you know, I have a, a new God daughter. My best friend from high school recently had his firstborn, and him and his wife asked me and Ashley to be the godparents where, you know, we're involved and you're going to be a part of making sure that, she, that Annabeth is raised in the church and that if something happens to them, we're going to step in and raise Annabeth. And so my wife and I, you know, it's my goddaughter, you know. i got to get her something for Christmas. And so my wife found a one with a bottle on it that says, come and take it, like the Gonzales bottle flag, you know. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. You know, that's the gift we think. That, that's a good Christmas gift for a child that's going to lay there and try and eat their own fist. They brought gold and frankincense, which until I was, you know, at least 22, I had no idea what frankincense was, and a guy named Murr. You know, but as you start studying this and you look into it, there's a lot of symbolism, you know. Gold makes sense, okay? Gold is wealth. Gold is power. Gold is valuable. You know, we all have that one prepper friend who's a little bit off the hinges, and, you know, right now he's up in arms, you know, over, you know, the impeachment and everything else, and, you know, they're going to take our guns, and they're going to get mine bullets first, and, you know, you know, and I don't have a problem. I've got a little bit of a prepper streak, too, but he takes it, like, way too far. You know, the economy's going to crash, and gold's going to become, you know, you got to have gold, and it's... Easy there, buddy. It'll be all right. But gold has always been viewed as being valuable. And so even to them, it possessed great value. It was a symbol of power. It was a symbol of wealth. It was something you could trade. You could carry a small amount, and it had big value even then. So if you're traveling and you don't need to carry a lot with you, you need small stuff because so you got to carry it all by hand, gold's great. Frankincense is weird. Frankincense is an incense. You burn it and it smells really good. Now, it's rare. You don't just go out and find frankincense. But at this time, frankincense was primarily used in temples to worship. It is a recognition of the wor of the worthiness and that Christ is to be worshipped, of just who he is. And then the third one is the one that always just shocks me, and that was the gift of myrrh. Now, myrrh doesn't mean anything to us. Myrrh was a scent, was a, a, again, could be used in incense, exceptionally valuable, exceptionally rare during this time. But what made myrrh so valuable is that in small amounts, you can use myrrh to make a very, very potent sedative similar to morphine. So, hey, you've got this baby. It's a beautiful baby. So here's some gold, and here's some incense, and here's some morphine. symbolizing what was to come in the cross. That even at his birth, it was known what was going to happen. What Christ was going to endure for us to take on the weight of our sins, of our choices. That he would step in and he would pay the penalty and he would fill the void that we could not fulfill. You know, that's what these guys were looking for something. They found it when they found Jesus. Maybe Jesus himself put it back. Maybe it's probably not the, the right word to put that. Je Jesus normally put it pretty well. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the door will be open. Now, this verse can be used out of context. When it says, when Jesus says, "When you ask, it doesn't mean if you believe hard enough, you ask for a Bentley, you're going to get a Bentley." It, it, that's that's not it. That's that's garbage doctrine. But it does mean this: if you seek Him, you will find Him. If you ask Him to be with you, He will be with you. If you ask Him to save you, He will save you. 
He will be there. He will guide you. And, and guys, it, I wish I had the answers. I wish I knew how to tell you, you know, to make this Christian life, this walk simpler. Because, you know, I'm, I'm 38 years old. I've been in the ministry for a little over 10 years. Got a degree in theology from Liberty. At this point, I would have thought I'd have had it more figured out. And if I'm being honest... He there, doesn't. No. He doesn't. No. There are, and there are days that I feel dumber than I was the day before. And I just feel further and further. And I, I just... I mean, maybe the best way to put it is the more I know, the more I just know that I don't know. Sometimes the more helpless, the more lost I feel. And I know so many of us feel that at this time of the year, that even if you have a relationship with Jesus, you still feel like, gosh, I'm just, I'm looking for it. And maybe Billy just kind of hit on it real, real hard at the beginning. This time of year, we get caught up in so many good things. The time with our family, that's good. You know, man, I love my kids. You know, Christmas morning, watching them light up when, when, when Santa's come and there's a, a, a new bike or a, a bow and arrow waiting for them. Or the face, I'll never forget my, my young one, Gus, when he was three years old, all he wanted was a yo-yo. Like, you're just asking for a yo-yo. Yeah, yo-yo goes up and down. And you should have seen his face when he opened that present from Santa and it was a yo-yo. And just that. Man, that's great. That's great. As a dad, that's just... Mm, all right, and it's cheap. Yes! <laughs> you know? Because the other one was asking for an aircraft carrier. <laughs> so, And he didn't mean a toy. Well, this is so much better if you know his kids. <laughs> but, but guys, those things are good. But we get so busy, so caught up, so twisted, that we lose sight of the thing that is great. We lose sight of the thing that is really important and that at this time of year, we celebrate the fact that our God didn't tell us, hey, if you work hard enough, you can come up here. He said, hey, I love you, so I'm coming down there so that we could be with him. So if you guys don't mind, we're going to take just two seconds. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you right now and we praise you. We, we love you. We thank you for this time of year where we can celebrate you. And Lord, I thank you that we're not the first who have just gone off and we're looking for something. And that you've left us this guide in the Bible where you've shown us that we weren't the first and that we won't be the last. But that you've also shown us the way. That you've given us the ultimate path to be with you. And that you made it a lot simpler than sometimes we try to make it ourselves. And so, Lord, as we celebrate your birth and we celebrate this time of year, I ask that you would help us to calm down and to clear our minds and, and not just get so caught up on the many good things that I'm not against and that aren't bad. But, Lord, they're things that take our eyes off of you. So, Lord, I ask that you would help us to focus on that. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that, that is seeking you, that you would just help them right now to open their hearts and just cry out to you. Jesus, I'm here. I'm knocking. I'm at the door and I ask for you to let me in. Lord, be with me. So Lord, for all of us, as we all pray that prayer in one way or another, I just praise you. I thank you for your birth, for your burial, for your resurrection. I just thank you for all the things that you've given us, especially our salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I don't know whether to clap or just thank you, but that was a very, very meaningful presentation. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. that. And, hey, as always, man, Dennis is one of my best friends on earth, man. We don't get to hang out near as much as we used to sometimes, but uh, he's a good man. And, and what I've always respected the most about the way he delivers the message is it, it's always with humility and understanding that he's just as fouled as the rest of us. You know, sometimes church can kind of go the other way and look down on you a little bit. And he's always been very anti that. And I've always loved that about him. It's, it's always very real. So, man, 
thank you. I really greatly appreciate you as a friend. I greatly appreciate your perspective on religion because it relates to so many of us. Right. So, man, hey, thank you so much, brother. All right, love you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Captain, get on up here. Yeah. Hammer head. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now, you wait, have wait, a on. way of making things awkward. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You're really good with it. Well, or making them not awkward. Glad to be back. Glad to be seen. Tank's here. Woody's here. We got a ring in the house. Yeah. He bought the billy bag and caught a 13. I mean, bought the billy bag, catch 13 minutes. It's oh, like magic, God. right? Or luck. <laughs> magic luck. Whatever luck. You want to call it. There is a lot of luck in fishing. I don't care how good or bad you yeah. are. <laughs> a lot of luck in fishing. Yeah, absolutely. Man, it's been a while. It's been a while since you've been here. Uh, I know we both have two young boys that mine are right. playing sports. I was coaching their sports. That one back there sitting in the corner right now plays every sport known to man three times a year. But he's taking the winter off. and so uh, Taking the winter off to get better at fishing is what I heard. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to focus on fishing. There's a legacy here, dude. I mean, this is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that my kids can be. Not good at fishing is um, not one of them. Not really so, an option. You know, <laughs> he's, uh, he missed a lot of frog fish this year, so uh, we grounded him from sports until he figures the frog out. So <laughs> I don't know that I've ever heard of him grounding a kid from sports because he couldn't fish right. He shut it. So that's but, pretty great. That's pretty great. We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about yeah. a good subject. So tonight. we're we're really glad. I'm glad to have you back because. Yep. You know, I'm fortunate that I've gotten to bring on a lot of people on this channel. And, and I don't want to take anything away from any of them because everybody I've brought on here, I believe in their knowledge and capabilities and all that mm -hmm. stuff, or I wouldn't bring them on the channel. Um, but one thing that I've always appreciated about Roddy is this is not something he read somewhere or he's been doing it for 35 years. This is because this guy fishes harder and more hours than probably anybody on earth. I mean, I don't know anybody else on earth that spends as many hours on the water as this guy does. So... When you do that, as you fish more, you will learn that, like, like and some of you guys probably fish a ton, but for those that don't, as you spend more time on the water, you'll learn there's these little details mm -hmm. inside of general patterns that can make a huge difference, and we've kind of yeah. briefly discussed what he's going to talk about tonight. And listen, what he's going to talk about is nothing secret. It's something that I do. It's something a lot of people do, but he, he even told me, he's like, we're going we're gonna to go all the way tonight. We're yeah, going to talk about things. That, we're going to talk, uh, talk about bridge fishing. And you know, you brought that up. I do, I do fish a lot. In fact, um, I just just got rid of the boat. You gonna tell how many hours? <laughs> 2019 boat. Um, this is insane. 517 yeah. hours on the motor. Yeah. So That's whoever cool. buys that boat, don't sweat the hours. Honestly, don't. I talked to That's the Yamaha true. rep. Yeah. These things are these things are built to run four or five thousand hours. You break them um, in right, and you keep the maintenance on time, and they last. Which, which we both do. We both, we're, we're both adamant about it. I didn't have 500, but I do have no, like 415 no, um, on mine from last year. But we, it, it's been a great year, man. I, I want to start by saying that everybody at home, yeah. thank you guys. Uh, I've been blessed. I've been fortunate this year. Um, uh, we have had a very successful year at the Cap Bronze God Service and the Ear Lake Fort God. Mm -hmm. And 2019 has been unbelievable. Now, that being said, 2020 is going to be twice as good, twice as big. We're going to catch way more fish, bigger fish, and we're going to help you guys catch more and bigger fish. Yeah, our, our deal, we've been kind of talking a lot the last few days and the uh, last week or so. And, um, you know, what we really want to do is just take everything to another level. From the quality of the content we give you, the volume of content we give you, we want to give you more ways to catch more and bigger fish than we ever have in the past. We want to give you more entertainment value because... I mean, at this point, I think it's pretty fair to say, and I say this with all very, very humbly, but at this point, we have also become... You don't become, say nothing very humbly. This dude right here. <laughs> we have also become somewhat... I, mean, I think some people are watching us for the entertainment value. Hey, here's one and thing. So we're going to try to I, be I more entertaining. I want to bring this up. Way to this make is, it awkward again. That's this twice is not, Twice no, not if you're look, keeping count at home, folks. Look, don't interrupt me, num number one. I want to bring up something serious, and I don't know if we can zoom in, but... The ear hair that you have growing right now. <laughs> Third time tonight. Is atrocious. Third, third Look, time. I've been wearing a beanie a lot. I didn't know. Anybody at home that's a United States Marine, please go ahead, drop down in the comments. Um, say something to this, this Marine about the ear hair. I mean, it, it really, it looks like there's something crawling out of it. I didn't know ear. if you might need to repel from somewhere later. So Dude, um, it's uh You're it's repelling real ready to go. But, that's well, what, what I'll leave you alone about that. That's the what the drill instructor used to say. He used to say, boy, you going to repel from that nose? Hey, you better trim that thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. So we're going to talk bridge fishing. Yeah, and, let's get on um, topic. Would you please do something productive here? Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Okay. And, and uh, we won't make it any more awkward. Uh, um, we won't make it any more awkward. I don't know if you – I just want to make sure you can hear me. 
What's up? You're gonna keep them counting home. <laughs> Everybody likes to fish bridges. Bridges hold more big fish than anything else in, in the lake. Anybody wanna argue with me? Anybody wanna argue with me? The biggest bass in the lake live on the bridges, folks. Who crappie fishes? Anybody y'all anybody y'all crappie fish? Yeah, I wouldn't admit to it either. Um <laughs> we'll take it one step further. Current state record. Caught on a crappie. Caught crappie fishing. Caught crappie on a crappie fishing. He, I, he caught you know on a saying. jig in a meadow or whatever so, happened. I don't know. There are bass. They're, they're like trolls. There's just monster bass that live under these bridges, and we all see them. Yeah. Um, and um, th it's all it's everywhere. And so when we talk bridges, let's 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 talk about not just bridges, but bridge type structures, which would be dams, which would be uh, any kind of a riprap dam. Let's take Lake Conroe. You know those little riprap dams that come out in front of the marinas. Yeah. I want to throw all that into the same um, category here. So uh, I've actually made some notes. Jetty, <laughs> jetties, you got <laughs> notes, dude? Yeah, I got notes. Oh, so, oh. We're going to talk about where on the fish. Sucker couldn't pass a college course if we're you paid him, but he's got notes for a fishing seminar. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> I did go to college. Um, uh, we're going to talk about where on the bridge to fish. So we got a couple of different areas. We've got our bridge corners, bridge embankments, whatever you want to call it. And then we've got our columns. And then we've got a specific area that um, the only reason we have a bridge is generally because there used to be a creek there. And so... Generally, when you're on, on all the, these man-made lakes in yeah, Texas, on all these reservoirs, which we only have one uh, natural lake, which is Caddo, but on all of these reservoirs in the state of Texas, most of the time, if you see a bridge, there's a bridge underneath that. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit on that bridge underneath. We'll, we'll, in fact, we'll go in depth one day. We'll talk about how we fish underwater bridges. Beds and underwater we're gonna bridges. talk about visible bridges where we fish on the bridge. I fish bridge corners. I fish the the sides of the bridge embankment, and I fish the columns. Okay, and so we're going to break the columns down. A lot of times, you're going to be able to use your side scan um, to figure out where the fish are on this. That's the first thing I do. When I approach a bridge, um, and, and you know, bridges used to not be uh, as popular as they are now. In fact, when I started fishing tournaments with uh, my partner from high school, man, bridges were like, a, like one of our little secrets. You know, Cedar Creek and some of these other lakes. Lake Palestine, they didn't get a lot of pressure. Um, in fact, used to, you guys at Lake Palestine, um, when that first media tournament hit in January, man, everybody's running up north into Kickapoo and all those other, and I could run down south of High Saw Ledbetter 155, and I could at least scratch out a nice 14, 15, 16 pound limit, maybe not in the media tournament, but just in tournaments in general, throwing shaky heads and that sort of deal. So, um, I'm gonna start by side scanning these bridges. You got a lot of water, you got a hard structure. In the cold of winter especially, you've got an opportunity for the sun to beam down two or three days in a row and, and kind of hold in a little bit of warmth on those bridge corners and those bridge columns. Um, one thing you're gonna notice is when you side scan those bridge columns, I've got a bridge going across the water, I've got two to three columns coming down right here. Man, too bad I don't have a nice little fancy whiteboard to do this. But I've got two or three columns, maybe four columns. A lot of times I'm going to have a cross beam under there. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so you got your round columns. Most of the time your cross beam is going to be square or rectangle under there. Okay, and what I try to tell my customers and my friends that I'm fishing with, if you'll notice where those columns meet the bridge, there's usually a cross beam across there as well. I tell them just to envision that underwater. Um, and those are going to be key areas, okay? And so the areas I'm going to fish are going to be the corners, the actual columns, and then that cross, that cross beam. The high percentage areas are gonna be closer to the corners and around the creek channel. Make sense? So when, I, when I'm breaking down an area, I don't wanna just try to fish the whole area. Me and Billy did a great uh, seminar on breaking down a creek one time. You know, you take Running Creek or Birch Creek, man, that's a lake, I mean, that's a whole lake. We've got to focus on high percentage target areas. You don't wanna run around just Hitting everything in the we world. We talk about all the time being on these lakes in East Texas when you get overwhelmed with cover. You got yeah. t acres and hundreds of acres of grass or the whole lake's full of timber. Well, you got to focus on these, these different structures within that. And so, um, uh, and, and, and the way I put these notes, I, I ramble. Everybody knows that. I like to chase uh, squirrels. Um, one, one thing that I, I threw in there is shade versus no shade. In the summer, I'm really focused on the shaded area. That bridge itself will create a really awesome area for bait to, to run around yeah. during the summertime. Now, in the winter, I'm gonna start to, I'm gonna focus on the shade a little bit, but I'm gonna start looking at some of the bright areas, some of the spots that the sun's hitting. You know, um, it gives you an opportunity 
to find something that's got a little bit of warmth. Number one, the most important thing is the bait. You're gonna see the bait on these bridges. Man, the, the cool thing about fishing bridges with technology that we have today, even, even if you've only got 2D sonar, you know, you've got the cone on 2D sonar, you can, you can a lot of times see the bait on your sonar, especially on side imaging. You can see the bait and you can start to find the bait, then you can start to see the bass. And, and, and probably the easiest thing that we've got for us today, and I know you and I are running newer boats and having the great technology that Humminbird and Lawrence and Garmin, these other guys, is we have side imaging. Side imaging yeah. on bridges tells you where they're at. I mean, oh, it's yeah. just flat out, bam, there it is right there. You, man, they, they stand out, it's crazy. And so I use that to my advantage. When I start to fish a bridge, I side scan it every single time. Now talking about bridge corners, those are gonna be my primary targets when I'm fishing bridges. Um, uh, the windblown side's probably gonna be the, the side that I start with. During the shad spawn at Lake Fork, or any lake for that matter, uh, the, the, the bridge corners are a really big deal. The embankment, where the bridge, where, where the bridge starts and stops on the road and the, the embankment comes down. You know, and, and we don't want to confuse a bridge corner with riprap. Riprap is, when, when somebody uses that term, you know, and, and I think terminology is a big deal, you know, somebody goes, I don't care what kind of grass it is, it's grass. Well, I do, because if Billy's saying, hey, dude, you need to go here and fish the coontail, and I'm going back here and I ain't finding, I'm just finding some grass and I'm fishing pepper grass, I ain't, I ain't fishing what Billy's right. telling me to fish. Same thing with this. Rip wraps rock. Chunk rock. It's yeah. chunk rock. Ray Hubbard bridge, bridge aprons are yeah. chunk so, or rip wrap. The other thing, so if you've got like bridges here where you've got concrete slabs, they concrete. pour these big concrete slabs the same as they do boat ramps, so you have edges and you have ends. When you have edges, you create a little bit of an ambush point. And when you have the end where the concrete stops, you create another ambush point. So those are both points, you know, and um, ambush points are a big deal because... Well, these straight, if you don't mind me jumping in. No, no. These straight concrete bridge aprons that we have on Lake Fort, one thing that I don't think ever gets really talked about is, yeah, it, it is, um, it can be a heat conductor in the wintertime, but also algae, uh, moss, you know, a little slime grows on that concrete underwater. Yep. Well, bait fish eat that. And it's one of the reasons why you see these big... Which is why the wind is so important. Yeah. You know, people, people have always, and I'm going to chase another squirrel, keep me on track here. So people always talk about the wind know. blows the shad. Everybody heard that term, the wind blows the shad? Yeah, it doesn't. Well, yeah. the shad the shad can just go a little bit deeper. The wind's not blowing two foot underwater. But what, what, what happens is exactly what Billy says. The wind hits the bridge embankment or the bank or the stumps or whatever it may be, and it stirs the algae up. Maybe little fish a little goes, plankton in there. Yeah, the that. little fish go and they eat that, the big fish, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Um, uh, so <laughs> that is one thing that I've always thought was really funny. We're always like, you know, people are like, you got to find the bait fish to find the bass. Well, you got to find the algae and the yeah. plankton to find the bait fish. I mean, yeah. really, we're all out here chasing plankton and algae. And that's what it is. And that, that, is, that is truly why, um, with the exception of the shad spawn, that is truly why bait fish are generally in areas. It, there are times where, like right now, if I'm out on a bridge, those, and it's bluebird days, and shad are probably going to be pretty high. Because they're trying to get to the warmest water, shad mm -hmm. more especially. In the summertime, they're going to be high and they're going to be running up under the shade because they're wanting to get in the shade. They're wanting protection. You know, uh, fish are more worried about predators from above than predators from below. That's why their eyes are on the top of their head. <clears throat> and so they're going to stay in that shade. Um, talking about bridge corners, my two my two baits that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit bridge corners with, and I didn't bring one of them with me, um, but one of my absolute favorite baits in the winter to hit bridge corners with is a jerk bait. I mean, I have caught some absolute monster fish. Okay, this is a six cents provoke jerk bait. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know what color this is? <laughs> this is the catchem color. It's a good looking shad. This color. is the one that I caught them all. It's That's got the a same shad color I like to throw. Translucent. It's like green, um, it's green top. Yeah. I, I throw this around there. I also throw this around bridge columns. Those first one to three sets of columns closest to the corner, a lot of times those fish will move over to those columns and they'll suspend. This is a great, this isn't my go-to bait around the columns, but around the corners, this is one of my absolute number one go-to baits. My next go-to bait is gonna be a crankbait. Now, I'm not gonna tell you what kind of crankbait I throw because I don't have a specific kind. Sometimes I'm throwing like a Crush 50 or something like that. Sometimes I'm throwing a medium diving crankbait. 
A lot of times I'm throwing shad, but a lot of times when it's the water's cold, especially this time of year, I'm throwing a red crawfish type. Hey, there's something about that red when it's cold. Man. There's something about that red. You and I, we both know. I've 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 got an obsession with throwing red crankbaits. Me and Billy's been in my boat when I can't put the red crankbait down. Um, I like a red crankbait. I think a lot of times it's the same as an orange kicker blade on a spinnerbait. It just makes that bass, it's not real hungry, not real aggressive. It just makes them bite out of curiosity, it's aggression, or whatever. Yeah. I don't know why. I ain't asked none of them, but I know they bite <laughs> it. Um, the way I throw the jerk he bait. He does talk to them sometimes. I throw the jerk bait on a pretty small rod, you know. Yeah. Uh, a, and I'm a, I'm a jerk bait throwing some buck. So I throw this sucker on. This is actually a Kissel rod. It's a KLX. But it's little, dude. I mean, we ain't far off the pistol grip. No. And, and I like that particular rod just because I got short arms. When I'm twitching, I don't want it hitting my uh, elbow. What is it, 6.6 six medium? It's a 6.6 six, six medium action rod, which to me is a jerkbait and, rod. And I'm, I don't know, what, four inches taller than three inches taller than something like that? And I, I just literally throw the exact same rod, just yeah. a few inches longer. Yeah, and I so. I throw a 6.9 or 6.10 medium action rod. And that's a great rod. Yeah. That's a great rod. You just want it. You want a rod where you can make accurate cast. It's got a lot of give to it. Yeah. Um, this, this, uh, this jerk bait right here. There's two ways you can you can rig this. Straight out of the package with the with the split ring on it is great. The thing that I do, and you guys, I'm going to tell you the best way to learn a loop knot is to go on to YouTube, check out one of our videos, or just go Google loop knot, and it's going to be a lot easier than me trying to put it in front of this all this camera and stuff. But I tie a loop knot most of the time on my jerk bait. I, I take the split ring off and I save it because these are really good split rings. And I tie a loop knot, and I keep about an inch in that loop, and it just it gives the bait a little bit more action. Um, this is one of my absolute number one go-to baits. The other thing is the bridge columns, okay? And there's a couple bait ways that I'm gonna I'm gonna hit those. First of all, I'm gonna graph those. I want to see where that cross member is, that cross beam is. That cross beam is probably gonna be eight, ten. Well, I'm saying probably. I don't know where it's gonna be on your home lake or what particular bridge you're fishing, but a lot of times those fish are going to be sitting somewhere around it, on top of it, on the on the outside edge of it, on the windblown side of it. They're going to be somewhere around there. My favorite bait to throw is an Alabama rig, especially in cold water. There's two reasons. Number one, it's one of the best lures in the world for suspended fish. Number two, it's probably going to catch the biggest bass around. It's one of the best baits in, since I've been fishing, which I've seen like I started now, out sluggos. It's one of the best things I've seen. Name another out. one that the big professional tours banned. Name another. Yeah, one. they they ban it. They I mean they banned it because I caught so many fish on it, and they started watching the videos and they just banned the deal. Yeah. Which is there anything we can do about that? <laughs> I, I brought an Alabama rig for visual. You guys don't need to see an Alabama rig. I throw a five blade or a five wire um, four blade Alabama rig. The two different things that I do is I either put an open jig head on it around bridges. Or if I want a little bit more flash, I'll put an owner flashy swimmer on it. Let me um, ask you this: You throw a four blade or an eight blade? So four blade. Yes, I do. Both. I throw yes, I do throw both. Um, if if it's a bright if it's a bright sky, I'm somewhere like Rayburn or something. I'm busting out the eight blade. Every blade. Um, you know, I just kind of go with uh, <laughs> a little different theory, a little maybe wrong theory, but uh, I just go with the fact that if I've got all these baits and all these wires, I might as well just throw eight blades. Yeah, and I just throw eight blades all the time. And and, and that's a and he's talking about a fifteen dollar difference too, um, in an eight blade and a four blade young flash mob junior, an eight blade uh, um, hog farmers uh, thirty four ninety nine, mm -hmm. and the other one's twelve ninety nine. That's why I suggest that you buy the smash rig when they're in stock because they ain't near that much. No, and that's true. And I don't Ain't have any. He and doesn't have any. He sold them all. That's the point. That you guys bought them all. All you guys out there bought and, them all. And so an owner flashy swimmer actually adds adds an, one extra blade. And then it also becomes weedless. Now, it, it's going to get hung up in trees at times, but you can simply go over the top of it and, and knock it off. But what I want to do is, is when I find those bridge columns, I want to park my boat where I'm facing down those columns. So that, that column is one, two, three three, four, straight down that way. I'm gonna get my boat right with the, I wanna be I wanna be nosed into the wind, so I'm coming with the wind. I wanna get right there, I wanna throw around the bridge. Does that make sense to you guys? I'm making a sidearm cast of that Alabama rig. I'm throwing around the other side of the bridge, and then I'm gonna give it a countdown. Okay, it's about two foot per second mm -hmm. on, a, on most Alabama rigs. With about an eighth ounce? If you're using eight yeah. ounce jig heads. Yeah, which good. is pr pretty common. And, and I'll tell you the simplest way to do your countdown 
is click your button, give it a lot of slack, and count it. And when that slack stops, you know how long it took it to get to the bottom. It's pretty simple stuff. But it's about two foot per second. Make it cast, count it down to that bridge column, to that column in the middle of the uh, water, and then just give a steady retrieve. I'm throwing a big rod, 710 extra heavy kissel rod. I'm throwing a six to one reel. You could throw a seven to one reel. I like to throw a six to one reel. I'm not real good at slowing down in life. Um, <laughs> so I throw 20 pound fluorocarbon line. I don't throw braid. I'm not a big believer in braid on Alabama rig. I think, I think it's the it's the same with a lot of baits. They have to load up on that, and I use a little bit heavier rod. Um, the next bait that I'm going to throw is.